So in a couple of recent videos, we've discussed the ability of rotation to counteract gravitation, leading to weight reduction or even levitation, referring to these principles as gravito inertial lift and the grafigigo or gravifugal force effect. Other videos have demonstrated the action of centrifugal force on fluids to induce levitation via vortex lift. But as incredible as vortex lift is, it still involves a fluid medium. Can rotation at sufficient speeds allow us to overcome gravity even within a complete vacuum? And if so, how fast would an object have to be spun in order to lose weight or levitate? And does this speed have any relation to the object's dimensions or to the dimensions of Earth itself? We know from rocket science that a rocket has to reach and maintain a minimum velocity of at least 25,038 miles per hour in order to escape Earth's gravity and enter space. We refer to this as the escape velocity, a figure which will be different and unique when on all other planets and massive bodies. We also know from orbital mechanics that a pro projectile, satellite, or space station has to maintain a certain velocity in order to remain in orbit and not crash back into the Earth. The International Space Station, for instance, travels at 17,150 miles per hour at a height of about 250 miles above the Earth's surface. But a satellite with a smaller orbital di diameter is closer to the Earth and thus under greater influence from gravity. It must therefore travel significantly faster than a satellite that is further away and hence will have a larger orbital diameter. Would similar principles apply to a rotating ring or disk? And if so, how would we determine and calculate the rotation speeds so that we could design conveyances of the proper dimensions which would exploit these principles. In this video, I will discuss the fascinating work of Otis T. Carr and how he apparently answered these very questions with a me method to determine what I would call the rotational escape velocity of Earth. So grab a drink, sit back, and put your feet up. This is quite a story. Otis T. Carr was born in West Virginia on December 7, 1904. Little seems to be known about his early life, but, but in a 1960 interview with popular television host Paul V. Coates, Carr said that he left school at age 13, after which he received no further formal education. Carr also said that he lived in New York City during the 1920s during which time he began his own self-directed research into science and engineering at the libraries of local universities such as Columbia University and New York University, and also worked as a desk clerk in hotels in order to support himself. During his studies, he said that he had the opportunity to speak with and work with a number of scientists, including the famed Nikola Tesla, would suggest that Carr worked in either the Wardorf Astoria Hotel or the New Yorker Hotel, as these are the New York hotels in which Tesla was known to have lived. During the early part of World War II in the early 1940s, Carr moved to Baltimore, where he worked in the Southern Hotel, which was torn down in 1999. When not at work, Carr continued his own research and experiments. He was eventually able to use the concepts that he learned from Nikola Tesla, as well as his own private research to form the foundations for his own unique propulsion concept. This concept was visualized in the form of a circular foil craft. It has the appearance of the classic flying saucer. At some point, Carr claimed to have witnessed a UFO in the sky, which he described as an electrified flying disc. The craft seemed to operate according to the same principles which he himself had been studying. 
And so this firsthand experience conclusively proved to him that such a propulsion concept was indeed possible. When asked how he could understand the complex science, science needed to conceptualize and design such a novel craft, despite having so little schooling, Carr pointed to his copious research into engineering and physics, thousands of experiments, and numerous conferences and discussions with Nikola Tesla and other brilliant scientists. Having left school at 13 years old, Carr may have been able to more readily grasp some of the more unconventional ideas and concepts of the universe, which enabled him, enabled him to develop his unique propulsion concept, a concept which he summed up as simply taking a wheel and turning it on its side and electrifying it. By the time Carr emerged on the 1950s flying saucer scene in Baltimore, Maryland, he was well versed in this alternative propulsion science and had allegedly already conducted numerous actual flight tests on small scale models to perfect his ideas. In 1955, he founded and presided over OTC Enterprises, a company which had the purpose of applying technology that was originally suggested to him by Nikola Tesla. He began promoting his company and concept offering to build a full-scale 45-foot flying disc which could travel anywhere on Earth and even to the moon within a matter of hours rather than the usual several days as with conventional space technology. Though his system is quite complex, according to Carr, the propulsion concept itself could be summed up simply as followed is in his own words. Any vehicle accelerated to an axis rotation relative to its inertial attractive mass immediately becomes activated by free space energy and acts as an independent force. The inertial attractive mass here, of course, is the Earth. It is also important to note that Carr differentiated between the concept of a perpetual motion machine, which he deemed impossible, and free energy. Free energy, of course, which is a practical reality, even when just considering the more con conventional manifestation of it, such as solar energy. We may have heard of flying discs, which rotate while taking off and while in flight, or seen the concept visualized in various media. And if Carr's story is true, then this rotation is maybe the actual source of propulsion for those particular shaped crafts. From Carr's statement, the idea is essentially that if a disc or ring can be made to rotate fast enough, then it will be able to levitate within a gravitational field. We explored this concept in the last video entitled Of Mass and Energy, Rotation and the Gravifugal Force Effect. There is a link to that video in the description below. Now a habitation cabin attached to a rapidly rotating disc like this will result in the cabin spinning in the opposite direction due to Newton's third law of equal and opposite reaction and conservation of momentum. This will obviously prove disastrous to any occupants who would as a result be flung violently against the inner walls due to centrifugal force. But Carr and his team solved this problem by adding another disc on the same axis, which would rotate in the opposite direction. Hence, each rotating disc will have each other to push against and would react against, thus canceling out any rotational inertial effect on the cabin, which will be situated on a stationary axis in between the two rotating discs. Now, with the basic description of Otis Carr's craft concept, we might be curious as to what mainstream science has to say about rapidly spinning objects such as gyroscopes. In 1989, a report published by Hideo Hayasaka and Sakai Takeuchi of the engineering faculty at Tohoku University in Sendai, Japan, reported that small gyroscopes lose weight when spun under certain conditions, apparently in defiance of gravity. But in order to not just be casually rebuffed by the scientific community, they wisely claim to not have defied gravity, 
but simply said that their results could not be explained by the usual theories. The experiment looked at weight changes in spinning mechanical gyroscopes whose rotors weigh 140 and uh, 176 grams or 5 and 6.3 ounces. When the two gyroscopes were spun clockwise as viewed from above, the researchers found no change in their weight. But when spun counterclockwise, they appeared to lose weight. The rate of decrease was small, ranging up to 11 thousandths of a gram when the gyroscopes turned at 13,000 revolutions per minute. But two effects were significant. First, the weight loss increased as the speeds did. And second, the pattern was stronger with the larger gyroscope, indicating that the results might be applied to still larger objects. The Japanese scientists said that the weight measurements were carried out 10 times at speeds between 3,000 and 13,000 revolutions per minute. In their paper, the Japanese scientists outlined an extensive search for possible sources of experimental error, including stray magnetic fields, vibrations, and defects in the gyroscopes and measuring devices themselves. A small number of follow-up experiments were conducted by others in order to test what became known as the Hayasaki Takeuchi effect. A group at the University of Colorado in Boulder and the National Institute for Science and Technology, NIST, formerly the National Bureau of Standards, reported in a paper which was later accepted for publication by the physical review letters. To within their observed error of plus minus 0.5 milligrams, the Boulder group observed no weight loss of the gyro and no dependence on whether its vertical rotation was clockwise or counterclockwise. In contra contrast to the original experiment, the Colorado scientists used a brass rotor with a hardened steel shaft rotated at speeds between 1,000 and 9,000 RPM. The rotor turned on jewel bearings. It had about three times the mass of the rotors used by Hayasaka and Tekeuchi and an overall sensitivity to the reported effects that was about 10 times greater. There were also other differences in this method. The Boulder experiment had very little ma magnetic material in the gyro uh, placed the experiment in a lucite uh, chamber and spun it up with a jet of compressed nitrogen that was blown tangentially on a nylon gear and it did not evacuate the chamber. Hayasaka and Tekeuchi used an integral electric motor to drive their rotor, which include magnetic material. The gyro rotated on ball bearings and was enclosed in an evacuated steel chamber. In a related paper that was just appeared at, that had appeared around the same time in the journal Nature, Dr. S. H. Salter, a mechanical engineer at the University of Edinburgh, presented calculations showing that the Hayasaki Takeuchi observations might be explained by the actions of vibrations from the rotating gyro on the ball bearings of the apparatus. So the general consensus with these experiments has been that the tests were inconclusive, suggesting that rotating and spinning objects actually experienced no discernible weight changes. Vibrations in the original experiment were theorized to have interfered with weight measurements and caused the anomalous readings. However, there are at least a couple red flags with this conclusion. One is that the weight reductions in the original experiment occurred only when the gyroscope disks were spun uh, counterclockwise, but not when they were spun clockwise. One would think that if vibrational interference were actually the cause, that the weight changes would still manifest regardless of rotation direction. The second red flag is that the rotation speeds used were, in my opinion, suboptimal, especially for professional laboratory settings but this may have been deemed less important since the investigators used very sensitive scales. The speeds also seem to be chosen at random, 
speaks that were somewhat high, but not really in reference to anything. We must also note that the follow-up experiments in particular curiously utilize rotation speeds significantly lower than the 3,000 to 13,000 RPM speeds of the original experiments. We know from previous descriptions of Otis T. Carr's system that the, his rotation numbers were not random, but were actually values that were relative to the Earth's own rotation rate. This would suggest that the levity effect would not come into play until the rotation rate was closer to the relative rotation of the Earth, and hence any weight changes would still have gone unnoticed even on very sensitive scales. So right now, I will play a short audio clip on Carr himself from the John, uh, Long John Neville show recorded in early 1958, in which he explains how he arrived at his rotation speed numbers. When the relative rotation of any inertial attractive mass is, uh, is a matter of dimension. So that the Earth, uh, if we say that it is 8,000 miles in diameter, we know its fixed rotation is 1 in 24. If it were 1 mile in diameter, its rotation would be 8,000 in 24. And by the same system, our 45 foot craft will have a relative rotation of about 580 RPM a minute. And in this, when it reaches this rotation, it is totally independent of its inertial attractive mass. In an electromagnetic field. So Carr says that the rotation rate is a matter of dimensions. Working out to a re relation between Earth's diameter and its known rotation rate to the craft's diameter and then calculating the craft's relative rotation rate. There are at least a couple of different ways to perform the calculations. One is using RPM and the other is using circumference velocity. Carr uses the RPM method, starting out with the Earth's known diameter of 8,000 miles and its known rotation rate of one revolution every 24 hours. This works out to one revolution out of 1440 minutes or 0 0.00069 revolutions per minute. Likewise, a circular object with a one mile diameter will complete 8,000 revolutions in 24 hours, which equates to 8,000 revolutions out of 1440 minutes or 5.6 RPM. Thus, Carr calculates that a disc-shaped craft with a, di a diameter of 45 feet will have to rotate at about 580 RPM. This number seems a little low as I get 653.6 RPM when I do the calculation, but it is still within range. The craft's rotation speed should be variable to accommodate any deviations from the calculations. We can then use the same procedure to calculate the rotation speeds for Carr's 10-foot model, which comes in at around 2,939.4 RPM, and then 5,050.5 RPM for the 6-foot model. Now for the circumference velocity method, we can calculate thusly, starting out again with one revolution in 24 hours for a 25,132.7 mile circumference Earth. So one revolution in 24 hours equates to 0.29 miles per second or 1535.9 feet per second. For a one mile di diameter, the circumference is 16,587.6 feet. We know that a one mile diameter disk will have to revolve 8,000 times in 24 hours. So 8,000 times that number yields 132,700,800 feet divided by 86,400 seconds, which equates to, again, 1,535.9 feet per second. We might notice that all of these figures are slightly in excess of 1,000 miles per hour. 1,000 miles per hour is the approximate ground speed of the Earth at the equator. 
we recall from the video rotation and the gravifugal force that the Earth's centrifugal force at the equator is at a maximum and results in a type of levity to any masses at or near this latitude. Increasing this velocity up to a speed of 16,000 miles per hour plus will result in objects essentially levitating above the Earth in what could be called low Earth orbit or satellization. So this principle appears to be in line with Carr's theories. A ring, disks, or even a ball rotating at a relative velocity greater than the Earth's ground velocity at the equator should begin to lose weight and essentially levitate with increasing velocities. Some have named the speed in which this begins to happen the car velocity. So though the 1535.9 feet per second or 1047 mile per hour speed is the same for any dimension, it still manifests as a larger RPM the smaller the circular mass is as the smaller object must complete more revolutions to cover the same distance. And larger objects, of course, fewer revolutions. This may be why the Japanese team reported that the results seem to be stronger with the larger gyroscope, as the same RPM for that size gyroscope should result in even greater weight loss. We could also deduce that the larger gyroscope could be spun more slowly and achieve the same percentage weight loss. Now using the same mathematics that Carr used to determine a rotation rate of 580 RPM for his 45 foot craft, the rotation rate for a small disc that is four inches in diameter and which is likely close to the diameters of the experimental gyroscopes would be nearly 90,000 RPM in order to become weightless according to gravito inertia and gravifugal principles. But of course, a fraction of this speed should result in the same fraction of weight loss. And this seems to be what was observed in the original gyroscope experiment. Another interesting thing to note in comparison with Carr's saucer design is that the weight loss as mentioned in the Japanese experiment seems to have been polarized or directional and that the effect only occurred when the gyroscopes rotated in the counterclockwise direction. This suggests that only one of the rotating discs in Carr's design actually provided the actual lift and propulsion, while the other discs only provided for the previously mentioned counterforce to neutralize the force on the craft's habitation cabin. An additional question, of course, would then be, why was the effect directionalized? Some have pointed to the Coriolis effect as being involved with levitational propulsion forces that are based on rotation. And if such is the case, then this would mean that in the, as in the Japanese experiment, only the counterclockwise rotating disc and car's craft propelled the craft in the northern hemisphere. And so one might wonder, wonder if the plate rotating in the clockwise direction only provided prop uh, propulsive force in the southern hemisphere. And would the disc share propulsive load at the equator? The Coriolis effect likely will have little effect on the craft as it is a relatively small system, but if it did, these would be interesting inquiries. So at least now we have a basic idea of Carr's claims, as well as how they relate to current scientific work. But going back to Carr's personal story, according to mainstream information, Carr did patent a saucer, but it ultimately only resulted in an amusement device that was composed of a dummy mock-up of his 45-foot design. A deal was made with the amusement park called Frontier City that was loca located in Oklahoma City, and Carr traveled there to construct the craft. While there, he claimed that funds from the mock project would also be sufficient to enable the development of a working six-foot diameter prototype of his saucer for a demonstration flight at the fairground. Carr said that his demonstration model would rise to about 500 feet. He also said that he would construct and launch an operational 45-foot saucer matching the amusement park mock-up and would fly from the fairground to the moon and return in just a few hours. 
The six foot model saucer was supposed to have been launched on April 19th, 1959, but it never made it to the fairground. And neither did Carr, who was found to be sick in the hospital on that day. Visitors to Carr's factory site during the period did not see any actual working models. Instead, they were shown a non-operational three-dimensional illustration of Carr's ideas made mostly of wood. Carr was apparently not present at the showing. We've already heard a small part of Carr's promotion of his technology, which was an audio clip taken from his appearance on the Long John Nubble show in the spring of 1958. Nubble was an influential New York City talk radio show host who was hugely popular with listeners due to his covering of offbeat and unconventional topics such as UFOs and other paranormal phenomena. Having been unable to bring his demonstrations at Frontier City to fruition, Carr seized upon the opportunity on the show to offer to build a full-size functioning craft to reach the moon, the moon for about $20 million, which is a little over $200 million in 2022 dollars. Upon securing an order, Carr also offered to construct a smaller model before the construction of the full-size craft at no extra cost in order to demonstrate to the buyer that the craft's principles would work exactly, exactly as claimed. But Carr ran into legal troubles when in January 1961, he was convicted of selling securities without registration in Oklahoma and fined $5,000. This figure may not seem like a lot, but the amount would be equivalent to nearly $50,000 in today's money. But this was still far less than the sums that he had obtained from investors in the area. Carr filed for an appeal but it was denied on March 1st, 1961. Carr could not pay the fine and was sentenced to a 14 year jail term, which he served a portion of. After release, Carr is said to have fled the state, soon resurfacing elsewhere, apparently still promoting his free energy and propulsion ideas. In 1966, he claimed that the reason his earlier demonstrations failed was simply that he did, had not had the time to finish the devices. Carr is said to have lived out the remainder of his life in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he died on September 20th, 1982. But is this really the conclusion of Carr's story? Was Carr nothing more than a fraudulent pseudoscientist who made bold claims in order to swindle investors out of money for a propulsion system, which he had no intention of actually developing? Similar to the case with John Warrell Keeley, my question, would be, my question would be that if the plan was solely to commit fraud, then why not collect a large sum of money as quickly as possible and then just disappear? Recall that the $5,000 that Carr was fined was still quote unquote far less than the sums he had already received from investors. This means that Carr ultimately received far more than what would be equivalent to about $50,000 in today's money. Though the exact amount is unknown, twice, three times, or any other multiples of the sum of $50,000 will be more than enough to get lost today, even escape to another country. But why remain and get caught up in various legal issues, possible jail time, and ultimate humiliation in the public and professional denouncement of personal ideas and concepts which never had any basis in reality? These are essentially the, the same things which happened to John Warrell Keeley, who I might add also had regular access to very large sums of money, which flowed through his Keeley Motor Company over a number of years. Yet Keeley never disappeared and never sported a lavish lifestyle. And in fact, according to the book, Free Energy Pioneer by Theo Pagemans, there are a number of times when the Keeley household was near bankruptcy. Even still, fraud can't be entirely ruled out, but can sabotage also be entirely ruled out? Some have su suggested that Keeley, like Nikola Tesla, 
were set up to fail? Was Carr also set up to fail? Were the men allowed to come close to succeeding only to have the rug pulled from underneath their feet? This certainly seemed to happen with Tesla and his energy transmission tower that was financed by J.P. Morgan. And so did Carr, Carr die in obscurity, having been labeled a fraud? Or is there possibly more to the story? For me, it's hard to believe that no wealthy private individual or private company ever took Carr up on his offer to at least build small working models of his craft. According to Carr, he had already experimented with, a, with small models with a certain degree of success. Here we see a reenactment of the alleged sighting by a farmer near uh, named Edwin Fur in Sask uh, Saskatchewan, Canada on September 1st, 1974. Fur claimed that uh, he had seen several 11 foot diameter saucer shaped crafts that were levitating about one foot above the ground in his canola field. The crafts were said to have been rotating counterclockwise at a very high rate of speed. They had a gray metallic color and looked weathered and worn in appearance. After some time, the crafts rose up into the air in stepwise fashion with plumes of what looked like exhaust coming from two appendages on their bottoms. A variation of the account asked a detail that powerful vibrations began to emanate from the crafts just before they rose and flew off. At 11 feet diameter, each craft would have been large enough to fit two and possibly three seated occupants. But they also could have been large remotely operated drones. Could these drones have been the result of Carr's experiments? During his 1960 interview with Paul V. Coates, Carr mentioned having a workshop that just been built in the high desert which could refer to any one of a, a few deserts in New Mexico, Oregon, or California. Did Carr continue his work in secret? And if so, did he succeed in building his full-scale 40-foot craft? Well, anyone who has studied Otis Carr's work has probably heard of a man by the name of Ralph Ring. Ring claims to have been one of Carr's technicians and close confidants during the time of Carr's promotion campaigns and legal troubles. What's interesting is that he gives an extension and different ending to the official Carr story. Ring says that Carr actually did succeed in building his 45 foot craft and claims that he was actually a part of the demonstration by Carr of his incredible principles. Principles which even exceed the claims that we've heard so far. Ring has iterated his version of events a few times in public, but became even more well known when he appeared on season one of the History Channel series, UFO Hunters, on the episode entitled Reverse Engineering. On the episode, which originally aired on March 12, 2008, Ring introduced himself as one of Carr's former technicians. He made some interesting claims about the propulsion system, which had not been ex much expounded upon, uh, by Carr himself in any literature or audio rec recordings that I've yet heard. He said that the craft ultimately operated according to the principles of resonance and that a craft approaching resonance with its surroundings reaches a point in which the external planetary gravity is neutralized and becomes, as Tesla might say, attached to the very will work of nature and thus able to harness unlimited energy. Additionally, the craft itself, as well as any occupants within, would be completely unaffected by the inertial effects of the sudden turns at extreme velocities and would be fully protected from the sudden decelerations and accelerations that are often associated with UFOs. It's as if the craft would be, possess its own gravity and would move within a protective bubble or force field allowing for the safe execution of extreme aer uh, aerial maneuvers. Another of Ring's claims is that the 45-foot uh, craft vibrated at a frequency of aquamarine. 
Now, what's especially fascinating about this is that this is within the electromagnetic spectrum of visi visible light. An object resonating at this frequency is in fact vibrating at a light frequency of about 606 times 10 to the 12 cycles per second, or 606 terahertz. And indeed, Rain claims that during an onboard testing of the craft, that he was engulfed by a brilliant blue light. Ring said that while on board this craft, he and some accompanying associates traveled almost instantaneously to an area about 10 miles away, left the craft for a few minutes where they were told to collect rocks and other earthen materials, and were just as quickly whisked back. What's even more intriguing is that he claims that he wasn't able to recall what had occurred for quite some time actually doubting that the experiment even worked. However, he was later informed by Carr that the experiment had in fact worked, and Ring and his associates were told to empty their pockets, full of earth debris, as proof. Some have noticed that this account is similar to that of the infamous Philadelphia experiment. And Bill Burns, one of the stars of the UFO Hunters and author and editor of UFO Magazine, noted that Ring's description was essentially the same as those given by a number of UFO adoptees, particularly the blue light, the feeling of vibration, and what is typically known in UFOlogy as lost time. This account goes well beyond just counter-rotating discs and simple levitation. What was described here was almost akin to a type of teleportation. Was there more to the system than, than just a rotational propulsion system? Ralph Ring explained that the craft ultimately traveled by matching its vibrational frequency with the vibrational frequency of a predetermined location. With what we know about sympathetic resonance, a craft in such a state should become in sync with that region and consequently should experience a massive gain in energy. Energy flows from regions and objects of greater energy to regions or objects of lesser energy in the universal attempt to achieve energetic equilibrium. This flow occurs most efficiently during conditions of resonance. But just as importantly, there is also a force of attraction between objects that are in resonance. John Warrell Keeley called this force sympathetic attraction, which is also one of his terms for gravity. This goes back to Keeley's laws of attraction and repulsion, as well as what is called what are called the jerkney forces, which demonstrates that objects vibrating or oscillating in unison will experience a mutual attraction towards each other. But Keeley's laws of attraction and repulsion refer particularly to his work with sound. But sound as we define it cannot travel in the vacuum of space, but light of course can. And so it should follow that light waves, just as gravity waves, might follow similar laws of attraction and repulsion as sound waves do in a gas, liquid, or solid mediums. And actually, certain arcane philosophies, such as the summum, actually make no distinction between sound and light, but instead envision light as just much higher frequency harmonics of sound vibrations. The following article says that the great third summum principle, the principle of vibration, embodies the idea that motion is manifest in everything in the universe. Nothing is at rest. Everything moves, vibrates, and cycles. The summum teachings are that not only is everything in constant motion and vibration, but that the differences between the various manifestations of the universal force are due entirely to the varying rate and mode of vibration. It gives a thought experiment involving an increasingly fast spinning object. The hypothetical concept of a rapidly moving wheel, top or cylinder, shows the effects of increasing rates of vibration. The concept supposes a wheel, top, or revolving cylinder running at a very low speed. This revolving thing will be referred to as the object. Suppose the slowly moving object may be 
seen readily, but no sound of its movement reaches your ear. The speed is gradually increased, and in a few moments its movement becomes so rapid that a deep growl or low note may be heard. Then as the rate is increased, the note rises on the musical scale. The motion being still further increased, the next highest note is distinguished. Then one after another, all of the notes on the musical scale are, sound, are sounded, rising higher and higher as the motion is increased. Finally, when the motion has reached a certain rate, the final note that is perceptible to human ear, ears is reached. The shrill, piercing shriek dies away and silence follows. No sound is heard from the revolving object. The rate of motion is so high now that the human ear cannot register the vibrations. Then comes the perception of rising degrees of heat. After a time, the eye catches a glimpse of the object becoming a dull, dark, reddish color. And as the rate increases, the red becomes brighter. As the spe speed is increased further, the red melts into orange. The orange melts into yellow and then follows successively the shades of green, blue, and violet. Finally, all color disappears, the human eye not able to register them. But there are invisible rays emanating from the revolving object. Electricity and magnetism are emitted when the appropriate rate of vibration is attained. When the object reaches a certain rate of vibrations, its molecules disintegrate and resolve themselves into the original elements or atoms. Now we may also remember from the video Vibratory Lift Part 2 that some believe that a 1 terahertz is the frequency of gravity. Thus the rotating or spinning wheel uh, just described would have radiated gravity in the range in between sound and light. And thus we can see uh, a manifestation of the unified fields within the summum principle. But with this aquamarine resonating concept, ring is ultimately describing a light propelled craft, particularly one propelled by the interactions of resonant vibrations in the light frequency range. Now this should not be completely a, a foreign concept for those versed in space travel, as light propulsion has been proven as real and practical by the planetary society via their experiments with solar sails in outer space being composed of sheets made from ultra thin reflective materials, solar sails are able to practically harness the energy and momentum of photons from the sun and potentially other starlight, starlight in order to propel a small light weight craft up to submunimal breeze. It has also been determined that using a powerful array of ground or space-based lasers uh, this might be even more efficient. When directing at the floating array of solar sails in space, the laser light would be able to propel the nanocrafts outfitted with solar cells to an astonishing 20% of the speed of light in just a matter of minutes. And consider that this is pretty much still a brute force method. Is it possible that resonant light propulsion in the manner that Ralph Ring suggests could better harness the forces and properties of light, enabling similar nanocrafts or perhaps even megacrafts to reach higher velocities. But one nagging question is how could cars craft possibly generate frequencies this high? Well, another key feature of cars spacecraft design is a free energy power system of which a device called the Utron was a principal part. The Utron was designed as an electromagnetic energy accumulator, which had the purpose of harvesting energy from the craft's environment. Carr explained that the Utron was a dimensional product that was conceived with the dimensions of space itself in mind. It had the appearance of two ice cream cones with their circular bases joined as shown, essentially a miniaturized version of the craft itself. Ralph Ring said that there were various versions of the U-trons, with some possessing a winding of copper wire 
which started from the point of one cone, expanded to the rim of the joined cones, and then back down to the point of the opposite cone. In function and property, it could be described as a rechargeable battery capacitor solenoid combo. It was a condenser or what we call a capacitor today, but also a battery as it had a cavity in the center of the joint basis, which con contained an electrolyte, which was allegedly charged due to the action of its high speed circular rotation. The article here says that this use of a condensing component in planetary rotation provided a measurable storage capacity of low at high circumference, uh, circumference speeds. In the disk of inventor John Searle, as that of Carr, the accumulated load coming from the element in rotation is discharged into electromagnets on the circumference of the disk. On the disk of Carr, the spin zone contains uniform reserves of condensers which produce oscillation pulses for the loads as received by the magnets at the edges. Actually, the power system is somewhat challenging to understand since we don't have a detailed circuit diagram by car showing how the electronic components were connected. But from the information just read, as well as what I could make out from Carr himself on audio clips, I believe I can give a somewhat accurate overview. The 12 utrons in total mounted on the inner plate made up of that which made up the central power core of the craft and provided the initial rotation of the craft's plates. As the craft is initially not in motion, all of the electromotive force must be provi provided solely by their inner electrochemical battery properties as they had an electrolyte core or as Carr explained, they could be filled with numerous individual batteries. Carr explained that each battery was to have a potential of 12,000 volts. The array of utrons would pass through horseshoe magnets, generating large amounts of electricity, and corresponding arrays of capacitors were being charged by both the utrons as well as energy from the atmosphere through ionization. The entire system also appeared to be tuned to the vacuum energy or energy from space. All of this energy would then be periodically discharged from the capacitor array via circuit breakers to electrify the cabin and lights. Additionally, the craft's rotation now brought to full speed would then be able to drive a regenerative coil system which would recharge the batteries similar, similarly to the alternator of a, a car. This system would help to power the craft even when it left Earth, in which the atmospheric energy would no longer be available. The vacuum energy, however, would still be available, which would allow the craft to still operate in an over-unity condition. Wow, so that's certainly a mouthful. But let's look at some additional information in an attempt to break down the system's properties and understand its conception better. The article goes on to say that, with the addition of the utron, Carr appears to have improved the basic anti-gravitational technology of inventor John Searle, who is also purported to have developed rotating flying disks. In Carr's words, when asked how the utron would gather additional energy from outside, he explained that this is due to a circular motion. Electrical forces are motions wherever they manifest. Now we have cycles in alternating current. AC gives you 60 cycles per second. We have discovered in our experiments that there is a space cycle related to electricity. And if we join the cycle, we can get energy from it. Now this sounds very much like John World Keeley's polar currents. We may recall from the video Vibratory Lift Part 2 that Keeley described using acoustic resonant vibrations to harness the three polar currents, which were the magnetic, the gravitic, and electrical. Whereas Keeley described the latter as the electrical stream, Carr seems to describe it as the electrical space cycle. 
Hence, joining the cycle concept as mentioned by Carr appears to describe the process of resonating in frequency and in phase with these energy streams called vacuum fluctuations today from space. Resonating in sync with these vast energies or vacuum fluctuations would enable a massive energy flow from space to the circuitry which has been tuned to them. When the utrons which were mounted on one of the disks were rotated, they passed through horseshoe electromagnets which were mounted on the other oppositely rotating disk. The 45 foot craft was set to rotate at 580 RPM and had 12 utrons and 12 horseshoe magnets. One of Carr's business associated uh, associates further characterized the utron as an energized armature motor with a self-contained moving battery capable of recharging itself. This moving rechargeable battery is certainly a novel concept and indeed rotating a battery or electrolyte at high speed through a magnetic field would be an interesting experiment. However, the principle itself might not be entirely new. As we know, an electrolyte is a solution of charged particles. And when charged particles pass through a magnetic field, they experience what is called the Lorentz force. We may remember from the video, Victor Schauberger's Water Science, that the separation of charges resulting from this force is what Schauberger called the diamagnetic effect. But whereas the diamagnetism in Schauberger's craft was developed in the rotating vortex chamber, it seems as though the OTC-X1 would also generate a diamagnetic field, but it would arise within the utrons electrolytic, uh, electrolytic cores themselves. In both crafts then, it appears that there was a rotating magnetic field. This follows as crafts of this nature are said to be designed after the Earth's own characteristics. The Earth has a gravitational inertial field as well as a surrounding magnetic field. And these spinning types of craft also possess an electromagnetic field and inertial field due to their rotation. These energetic fields serve to both protect the occupants and propel the crafts. But Ring in a discussion with a group called Project Camelot said that the function of the utrons was not only to generate electrical power, but also vibrational power. The full-sized craft was said to have revolved at 580 revolutions per minute, which equates to just under 10, 10 revolutions per second. With 12 utrons, this should equate to about 120 vibration cycles per second, or 120 hertz. But as the utrons were mounted on one disc while the horseshoe magnets on the other disc, rotating at equal speed but in the opposite direction, then perhaps the frequency was 240 hertz instead of just 120 hertz. Either way, this frequency is far from the 606 terahertz frequency of aquamarine. If anything, it seems like the craft might emit a very uh, audible hum at about 120 or 240 hertz. And indeed, Carr said that in audio clippings that the sound would be similar to the hum of a high voltage motor. Revisiting the previous article here, it says, on the disc of Carr's craft, the spin zone contains uniform reserves of capacitors, which produce oscillation pulses for the loads as received by the magnets at the edges. Oscillation pulses. Is it possible that the power harvesting system composed of the utrons, coils, magnets, and the capacitors function in a manner similar to a Tesla coil? The utrons moving through the horseshoe magnet coils sound a lot like Tesla's rotary spark gap, which allowed him to charge and discharge a capacitor into his primary coils. The spark gap discharges, like the utron's currents, would also have been of low frequency. And Carr did mention in his interviews that the design contained circuit breakers which would open and close. 
In a Tesla coil, the secondary coil could step up the frequency of the primary to a higher frequency, in addition to stepping up the voltages to megavolt levels. The frequency would depend on both the inductance of the secondary as well as the value of the capacitance at the secondary coil's terminal ends. As we can see by the formula for electrical resonance, the smaller the inductance and capacitance values, the higher the resonance frequency. The secondary and primary coils are usually set to resonate at the same frequency, but the secondary coil can also be set to resonate at a higher harmonic, in effect operating as a frequency multiplier. However, Tesla coils normally generate currents in the low frequency the low radio frequency range between 50 kilohertz and 1 megahertz. The color of the electrical arcs that are generated by most Tesla coils are due to gases in the air or metallic salts that are purposely placed on the discharge wires rather than the actual light frequencies which those colors represent. But if, is it, if it is possible, then perhaps an arrangement or an arrangement of the electrical circuits made from the utrons and capacitors were actually able to generate terahertz electrical, uh, electromagnetic vibrations in the aquamarine color range, just as described by Ralph Ring. And since Otis Carr allegedly learned many concepts directly from Nikola Tesla himself, which Ring also reiterates, then this is not outside of the realm of, of possibility. There are currently several groups attempting to rediscover the electronic details of the OTC-X1 power system in order to duplicate its principles, as it could potentially revolutionize everything from powering of the smallest electronic devices to the, the largest machines, and obviously space travel as well. So to me, the OTC-X1 power system seems to have characteristics of a Tesla coil it also put, has properties of Tesla's radiant ambient energy receiver concept. The main difference is that the harness energy seems to be ionization rather than the radiant energy per se, which Tesla spoke of, or perhaps it was both. But from the diagram, we can see that car's capacitor system operated on the same principle of charging a capacitor with ambient energy and then using automatic, an automated switch to periodically discharge the capacitor into a suitable load or even into rechargeable batteries. It would really only be a matter of creating a floating ground since the craft is not in contact with Earth's ground. Clearly more interest is needed in the area of free energy harvesting and wireless power research as this would be the ultimate realization of green energy. So in summary, Otis Carr's circular foil craft possesses an inner plate which contains the utron accumulators, regenerative coils, and capacitor plates, and rotated clockwise, while the outer plate, which, which housed the horseshoe electromagnet uh, magnets, rotated counterclockwise. And in so doing, the craft was set to perform this extraordinary double function of both levitating and drawing free energy from the environment. When the craft reached the activation rotation speed of 580 RPM, it was activated by the ambient energy from both the Earth and space. This energy will be combined with and, and amplify the energy already present within the craft in a manner which would manifest as over unity. Now, even more extraordinary may have been uh, the craft may have been able to travel via the interactive resonance of light, or what we might call luminous resonance. This luminous resonance concept of Carr's craft, as claimed by Ralph Ring, also sounds very similar to the artificial neutral center concept that was mentioned in the research of late alternative science guru Jerry Decker. In this concept, all masses have a natural neutral center through which the ether flows, and each of which has its own signature resonant frequency, or as Keeley would call it, a signature mass chord. 
using certain arrangements of energy generators, such as several solenoids slanted and aimed at a single point, it is said to be possible to create an artificial neutral center at that point. The solenoids would then be pulsed at the mass's natural resonant frequency or mass chord or any harmonic of it. With both neutral centers vibrating in unison under this condition, there would be both a flow of energy between them as well as a sympathetic attraction akin to gravitation between both points. Hence, in this case, the natural center of the mass would be attracted upwards towards the artificial one, resulting in levitation. The artificial neutral center can actually be aimed in any direction, resulting in propulsion, as the resonating mass would be directed towards that particular region in space. This is similar to how cars craft resonating at the frequency of aquamarine will be drawn to a region resonating at that same frequency. Ralph Ring said that the vibratory frequency of the previously mentioned area that was 10 miles away from Carr's testing site was predetermined to equate to the frequency of aquamarine. Thus, when the craft powerfully resonated to this frequency, the craft was almost instantly transported to that region. And so that region was functioning as an artificial neutral center. This may all sound like an odd fringe concept, but recently aerospace engineers at MIT successfully tested a similar propulsion concept called a hovering moon rover, which operates via a projected electrical charge, which enables electrostatic levitation. The article says, because they lack an ap atmosphere, the moon and other airless bodies such as asteroids can build up an electric field through direct exposure to the sun and surrounding plasma. On the moon, this surface charge is strong enough to levitate dust more than one meter off the ground, in much the same way that static electricity can cause a person's hair to stand on end. Engineers at NASA and elsewhere have recently proposed harnessing this natural charge on the surface to levitate a glider with wings made of mylar, a material that naturally holds the same charge as surfaces on airless bodies. They reason that the similarly charged surfaces should repel each other with a force that lost the glider off the ground. But such a design would likely be limited to small asteroids as the larger planetary bodies will have a stronger counteracting gravitational pull. The MIT team's levitating rover could potentially get around this size limitation. The concept, which resembles a retro-style disc-shaped flying saucer, uses tiny ion beams to both charge up the vehicle and boost the surface, surface's uh, natural charge. The overall effect is designed to generate a relatively large repulsive force between the vehicle and the ground in a way that requires very little power. In an initial feasibility study, the researchers showed that such an ion boost should be strong enough to levitate a small two-pound vehicle on the moon and large asteroids such as Psyche. The image here shows a small diagram of the test setup. The design uses tiny ion beams to charge up the vehicle and the surface underneath with little power needed. Such an ion boost could be strong enough to levitate a two-pound vehicle on the moon and large asteroids. To test this idea, the team initially modeled a small disc-shaped rover with ion thrusters that charged up the vehicle alone. They modeled the thrusters to beam negatively charged ions out from the vehicle, which effectively gave the vehicle a positive charge similar to the moon's positively charged, charged surface. But they found that this was not enough to get the vehicle off the ground. The team then thought of a way to transfer the craft's charge to the surface to supplement its natural charge. It goes on to say that 
by pointing by pointing additional thrusters at the ground and beaming out positive ions to amplify the surface's charge. The team reasoned that the boost could produce a bigger force against the rover, enough to levitate it off the ground. They drew up a simple mathematical model for the scenario and found that in principle it could work. Based on this simple model, the team predicted that a small rover weighing about two pounds could achieve levitation of about one centimeter off the ground on a large asteroid such as Psyche using a 10 kilovolt ion source. To get a similar liftoff on the moon, the same rover would need a 50 kilovolt, kilovolt source. This kind of ionic design uses very little power to generate a lot of voltage. The power needed is so small that you could al almost do it for free. To be sure that the model represented what could happen in a real environment in space, they ran a simple scenario in the research lab. The researchers manufactured a small hexagonal test vehicle weighing about 60 grams and measured about the size of a person's palm. They installed one ion thruster pointing up and four pointing down and then suspended the vehicle over an aluminum surface from two springs calibrated to counteract Earth's gravitational force. The entire setup was placed within a vacuum chamber to simulate the airless environment on the moon and asteroids. The researchers also suspended a tungsten rod from the experiment springs and used this displacement to measure how much the force of the thrusters produced each time they were fired. They applied various voltages to the thrusters and measured the resulting forces, which they then used to calculate the height that the vehicle alone could have levitated. They found these experimental results matched with predictions of the same scenario from their model, giving them confidence that its predictions for hovering a rover on Psyche and the moon were realistic. It goes on to say that the current model is designed to predict the conditions that are required to simply achieve levitation, which happens to be about one centimeter off the ground for a two pound vehicle. I'm assuming that this is two pounds on Earth, which of course would be about 0 0.33 pounds on the moon. And so this would need to be clarified. But it says that the ion thrusters could generate more force with larger voltage to lift a vehicle higher off the ground. They also say that the model would need to be revised as it doesn't account for how the emitted ions would behave at higher altitudes. So in effect, a projected energy ion beam was used in this project in order to help enhance electrostatic repulsion. And though it wasn't mentioned in the article, then perhaps a small gyroscopic device might also be used for flight stabilization. Even though this particular idea doesn't exactly create an artificial neutral center per se, the proposed principle is nevertheless identical to the projected artificial neutral center concept. It's interesting to see that even mainstream science is beginning to develop concepts that are similar to ideas that were once considered fringe or pseudoscience. We might also notice how the concept of free energy is also emerging in the mainstream when the hovering rover team says that its proposed levitation propulsion method could be achieved almost for free. So in light of this, pardon the pun, perhaps the luminal resonance propulsion system doesn't sound quite so far-fetched after all. But Ralph Ring even went so far as to claim that a craft, or any mass for that matter, in resonance would tap into the zero-point energy Zero point energy is the energy that is left over in matter or in space even after it's cooling to absolute zero or minus 273 degrees Celsius. Since heat is a reflection of molecular vibration, then a state of absolute zero means that the lack of this vibratory energy. Therefore, any energy which remains reflects the background energy of the universe, also known as zero point energy or vacuum fluctuations. These random quantum fluctuations of the electromagnetic and other force fields 
are ubiquitous in all in all throughout space. In essence, an empty vacuum is not really empty, but it's actually a seething cauldron of energy. These fluctuations are thought to be what is responsible for the Casimir force, a small attractive force that acts between two parallel uncharged conducting plates, which are brought in very close proximity to each other. Basically, this property arises from the fact that the vacuum energy contains all conceivable wavelengths of energy. When the plates are moved closer together, a decreasing number of these wavelengths can fit within the space between them. When the plates are about one millionth of a meter or one micron apart, the total force imparted by the fluctuations between the plates is overwhelmed by the the force of the much greater number of fluctuations on the outer surfaces of the plates, producing a force which pushes them together with a pressure that is equivalent to about one Earth atmosphere or 14.7 pounds per square inch. But I must also note that there are those who believe that the zero point energy has been grossly overhyped and misrepresented in metaphysical literature even going so far as to claim that the Casimir force is actually not a manifestation of zero point energy at all, and that the force can be calculated without regard for the zero point. Some scientists have also argued that while the zero point certainly exists, the weakness of the Casimir force, as well as other observations such as the continued expansion of the universe, proves that it is, it, that it is exceptionally weak. Nevertheless, other investigators have calculated that the zero point is so dense and potent that an amount of it equal to the volume of space of a single light bulb is sufficient to bring all of the world's oceans to the boiling point. And if so, then a craft which can tap into the zero point via resonance will have access to practically unlimited free energy, free energy and be able to travel vast distances at extreme speeds possibly even instantaneously. This could be offered up as a reason as to why Ralph Ring and his party were able to travel to their destination so quickly. But how could human operators possibly operate and pilot a craft which could move at such speeds? Maneuvers at such speeds in order to avoid obstacles and to manage flight trajectory would greatly exceed the capabilities even the most well-trained aircraft or fighter pilots. I would imagine that even an automated system will have great difficulty. Interestingly, Carr never mentioned much about piloting the craft during his promotions. He claimed that he and a couple of his associates, none of whom were pilots, would travel back and forth to the moon. This seemed to be to imply that anyone could pilot the craft without any need for special training. But how would this even be possible? Did the craft fly itself? Well, according to Ring, this was indeed the case. As with the demonstration model, no actual piloting was involved. The craft was simply gravitated to the region that it was tuned to at the time. He explains that the human operators are definitely involved, but not physically. He explains that the human operators actually become an extension of the craft, becoming quote unquote one with it. This was apparently achieved by the operators entering a type of higher mental state that was akin to meditation. Now this sounds absolutely fantastical. But again, in alternative science, this concept is not entirely unheard of. Accounts of John World Keeley's acoustical work claims that some of his devices would not work if there were non-resonant vibrational disturbances within the environment. There were also certain experiments which were said to work only if he was present or in direct physical contact with someone else who wanted to operate a particular device as the vibrations were quote unquote tuned to his person. There have been other accounts of similar symbiotic type devices in alternative science, such as that of David Alder, who claimed to see one at Area 51 in 1971. 
Adair said that the curious device, quote unquote, seemed alive and man manifested different colors according to his emotional and mental state. It's another fantastical tale, but even this sounds very much like the color changing mood lamps, which are actually a reality today. The picture here shows a device called a Clara, which is a smart lamp that uses EEG technology to visualize one's mental state, translating brain waves into light and sound and giving the user feedback of his or her mental state. The purpose of the lamp is to help the user maintain attention and focus, interpreting distraction by glowing red and humming quietly, while a cool blue light and ambient music indicate clear focus. Is it possible that symbiotic technology and devices similar to and even more advanced than the Clara Mood Lamp could have existed decades ago and actually used to test and pilot advanced crafts? It is only a matter of time before such concepts are applied to fighter pilots today as such systems would greatly enhance reaction times. And so what about Ralph Ream? Are his accounts legitimate? Or is he simply someone who thoroughly read up on Carr and just inserted himself into his legacy and narrative? From what I can gather, Carr himself didn't really discuss a luminous resonance concept for the craft as described by Ream, although he did have somewhat of an unstructured debate about the speed of light and possibly traveling at luminal, or even superluminal speeds with another guest during his appearance on the John Neville show. Ream's account is certainly extremely detailed and has been consistent throughout all of his appearances. To my knowledge, there has been a few significant deviations of details amongst his discussions. And further, his claims of a resonating craft do seem to line up with some of John World Keeley's assertions of resonance, sympathetic attraction, and the natural and artificial neutral center concepts. We also now know that even the incredible symbiotic technology is a reality today. Is everything that we see now actually been done before or perhaps decades earlier? It is indeed an incredible story, but perhaps we shouldn't be too quick to write off the entirety of the event as fantasy. When we look at the properties uh, such as the Casimir force, whether it is an actual manifestation of zero point energy or not, one thing is for certain, and that is that there are many, many forces in this vast universe, which we have yet to comprehend and harness. It is hence not unlikely that a handful of people in history may have discovered these principles, which would then subsequently purposely exclude it from our public education, while a select few are exploiting those same principles uh, for their own benefit. And so ultimately, Otis T. Carr's craft describes a multiphasic system not too dissimilar from Victor Schauberger's propulsion concept. Both crafts are said to have operated in a state of overunity. Both concepts utilize electromagnetism and are likely interacted with the geomagnetic field. And both utilize rotation. Schauberger's system uses rotation for vortex lift and also by default some degree of inertial propulsion as any large mass rotating at high speed would generate an inertial field. From what I can surmise, on Earth, Carr's system would rely mainly on the geomagnetic and gravito inertial lift and propulsion principles in order to levitate above the Earth's surface. Both of these aspects are completely dependent on the Earth's energetic properties for lift. The electromagnetic system interacts with the Earth's magnetic field for a portion of the lift, and we know that the rotation speed of the craft is a value that is relative to the inertial attractive mass upon which the craft rests, in this case, the Earth as the planetary body. But in space, far away from a planet's magnetic and gravitational fields, and also where sound does not travel, the craft might have been designed to utilize luminous vibrations and the sympathetic interactions between those vibrations 
for interstellar proposal. Interestingly, concepts of light proportion might also extend to rotation. In my last video, we talked about the gravifugal effect as presented by Pitar Bosnik Petros in a paper entitled Antigravity Equals Gravifugal Force. As a quick refresher, he describes this effect as one of the centri centrifugal forces that occurs where, in the process of rotation or orbiting, gravity has the function of centripetal force. Gravifugal force occurs in the following cases. One, if the celestial bodies rotate around their own axis. Two, if the celestial bodies orbit one another. Three, if the artificial bodies, such as rockets, satellites, or space stations, are orbiting the Earth. And four, in cases in which rings or gyroscopes rotate in the gravitational field. He goes on to say that the gravifugal force occurs in cases of so-called normal accelerations. For example, in those in which the gravipedal force acts perpendicularly to the direction of motion of the orbiting body and does not change its speed, but only changes the direction of motion, which it, which it curves and closes in a circle or ellipse. The mass of the orbiting body resists the change of direction of motion and its resistance manifests as the gravifugal force. Grafigal force or gravifugal force is therefore a manifestation of the inertia of a rotating or orbiting mass, which manifests itself at, as a resistance to the change in the direction of motion. With this concept in mind, we know that while the photons of light do not have mass, they do however possess energy and momentum, and that this energy and momentum are considerable as proven both mathematically and empirically in experiments with solar cells in space. Thus, it stands to reason that photons also have inertia, just as particles that have mass do. In another article by Peter Petras entitled Source of the Future, there is a subsection called Gravifugal Flying Craft Fitted by Quantum Ring or ring made of, by pure light. Here he says, when the light is passing near a mass of celestial bodies, it resists to the change of any direction of its movement. It then follows that photons of light traveling in a ring will have the same behavior and inertia as the particles of mass of a mechanical ring. And just like the rotating mechanical ring or disk, the ring of light will likewise develop a gravifugal force enabling it to lose weight or levitate within a gravitational field. The mechanism he proposes comprises the sources of light, which are directed into an evacuated toroidal tube with smooth, smooth reflective walls, much like those of a fiber optic cable. The light would travel endlessly through the tube at the speed of light without dissipation. And with, when sufficient light energy has been accumulated, the craft will levitate. In order to control the craft's ascent and descent, he suggests transparent photoelectric devices which will convert some of the light into electrical energy. Laser light will be the likely source for such an arrangement, just as it had been proposed for use with solar sails. Propulsion for the craft would be achieved with more conventional sources. It is not clear if Carr ever considered a craft propelled by light in this manner, but a craft which could be propelled by light, such as been demonstrated by solar cells and theorized with other methods is intriguing indeed. The concept of directly propelling a craft by the most fundamental energy force in the universe by which all other energies, forces, and on occasion even time itself are often measured, it's nothing short of poetic. So this is another big one to unpack. Perhaps the biggest yet. Levitation, free energy harvesting, light propulsion, and semi-teleportation. 
How do we determine what is fact? And how do we even begin to test these ideas and concepts? Well, I think that the rotational aspect may be the best place to start. It will be challenging, though, due to the high rotation speeds that are needed. Perhaps this is why there has been little work conduct conducted in this area, as it is challenging to find and obtain commercial motors, which can revolve at speeds of even 30,000 RPM or higher. And motors which can rotate that, that fast are often small and, and hence cannot generate the torque necessary to accelerate the attached disc or ring to the motor's top speed. We see here my implosion ring loaded with seven and a half pounds being rotated at just under 1900 RPM. Rotating the chamber faster and faster, the rotating ring rises due to aerodynamic levitation. This is the result of the vortex that is formed by the action of centrifugal force on the air within the, the chamber. According to gravifugal and gravito inertial principles, a similar setup, but with the chamber evacuated of all air, should also result in similar levitation, but it will have to rotate about 20 times faster, and hence would require about 400 times the energy. But I will be using a modified reduced scale setup and smaller, higher speed motors, which will hopefully significantly ease the technical difficulty. Whatever the results, I will present them here on this channel. Following these experiments, a reassessment will be performed to see what additional improvements could be made, such as seeing if adding a rotating magnetic field might give an enhanced effect as suggested by the accounts of Carr, Cyril, and Schauberger. In conclusion, we may wonder what the true story is. It is possible that Carr was a fraud, but really the only way to de definitively say one way or the other is to attempt an honest and thorough investigation into his work rather than to outright dismiss it. The story is made even more incredible with Ralph, Ralph Rings, additional accounts and different conclusion. Some might say even embellishments to the car story. His idea that a machine, even one as complex as the OTC X1, could have had a consciousness in an interface with a biological being is really out there. But it is not entirely baseless, as we have seen with the Clara lamp and other modern human and machine interface technologies. But there are uh, many other practical questions as well. The piloting of the OTC X1 craft seems particularly hazy, especially if we exclude the testimony of Reen. In fact, the innards of the cockpit and cabin were never really even discussed by Carr or even by Ring for that matter. It takes a lot of equipment and technology to sustain even a single human being in space. The cooking, eating, the collecting and discarding of waste, washing and cleaning, entertainment, sleeping, communication devices, etc. None of these were addressed, at least not in the audio promotions that we have from the time. Perhaps it was thought that the small amount of time that it took for the craft to traverse space rendered some of these amenities as unnecessary, but they don't take into account any unforeseen issues which might occur while in space or on the moon if the craft were, say, damaged or temporarily grounded. The logistics of the building of the craft are also unclear. For instance, how many people would be required to create a full-scale version of the craft? It can take up to a hundred people or more at NASA to get one person to space and back safely, and about just as many to build a rover and send it to Mars. Would it have even been possible for Carr and his team to hire this many people and train them all within a time span of just a few months? Even people with great engineering expertise would require some time in order to fully grasp and adapt cars, unconventional concepts and devices, which would have been markedly different to those 
that they were used to working with. We might also notice that at the time that Carr was introducing his novel propulsion concepts in 1958, the only known successful spacecrafts had been Sputnik 1 and 2, which had orbited the Earth just several months earlier. The late 1950s and early 1960s was the very dawn of the modern space age. Humans wouldn't orbit the Earth until 1961. The lunar orbiter 1 wouldn't orbit the moon until 1966. And the moon landing didn't happen until 1969. So Carr's assertions that he could develop a craft which could take several people to the moon and back must have seemed fanciful. This could be a reason why his design was rejected by the Defense Department, especially at a time when the extremely complex logistics of sending equipment and people into space was only just beginning to be understood. And yet at the same time, it may have also seemed somewhat probable particularly to the general public, and likely for the same reasons, in that the reality of space travel complexity had not yet been fully grasped. These are, in, in a number of other issues, are unclear. I find it credible that Carr did conceive of a workable propulsion system, as he seemed to be very confident in his ability to build it once he found the interested party but with the unaddressed logistical and operational issues, the unclear issue of piloting the craft and finding people who will even want to enter space in such a new and unconventional technology, I can see at least two possible scenarios. Perhaps Carr understood the machinery, but didn't yet fully grasp the complexity of space travel or perhaps he never really intended to actually fly to the moon in the first place. It might be possible that his primary objective was to sell his propulsion concept and design in order to earn enough money to perfect the technology, to finance his patents, and at the very least to build some working models. And then with definitive proof of concept under his belt, he could then finally attract the interest and financing of the military or private groups, something he had admittedly failed to do, at least as early, of the, as, early as the 1960s. Carr's sales manager may have advised him that he would have a much better chance in attracting attention to the technology if he hyped it up in bold claims, such as going to the moon and returning in just a few hours. This happens, this happens regularly in, in sales ads, so it's certainly not unusual. And we do see that his promotions did attract enough attention for him to build a mock-up for an amusement park. So if I had to go out on a limb, I think that this is a likely scenario. And what about Ralph Ring's additional testimony? Well, he details a number of aspects of the system, such as teleportation and the symbiosis function, which Carr never actually mentioned in any of his presentations. I find this rather odd, as those should have been key promotional features. This even extends to the brilliant aquamarine light that Ralph Ring described. As according to Carr, there was indeed a bluish luminescence to the craft but this was said to have been due to ionization, a byproduct of the capacitor energy harvesting system rather than to a luminous propulsion function. Perhaps it is possible that Ring worked with Carr in a later stage of the latter's research in which the, some of these additional concepts were included in the craft's functionality. Ring did seem to know a good deal about these unconventional concepts and seemed to have had considerable technical expertise. He once claimed that he had built a small levitation device with a subwoofer and a function generator sometime before he even met Carr. Adjusting the frequencies of the subwoofer, he was able to levitate a small ball at a time when mainstream scientists had only succeeded in levitating liquid droplets and small coins. 
so I find it a bit strange that he never brought any perfected demonstration models with him to his own presentations over the years. Hence, I find his accounts somewhat hazy. However, I can't completely dismiss his claims as they are actually based on real concepts as previously mentioned. Some of these concepts such as the extended energy beam to aid in the levitation of the hovering moon rover, free energy harvesting through resonance and radiant energy, light propulsion, etc. are currently being investigated as practical possibilities. Teleportation is probably the most difficult alleged aspect to grasp, but the type of teleportation that Ring described is less like the more familiar disappearance in one place and reappearance in another, and it's more like the near instantaneous gravitation of a craft to a distant region in space, which is brought about by a type of macroscopic resonant entanglement. And since we would be talking about resonant light vibrations, this gravitation could hypothet hypothetically occur at relativistic speeds. If the brute force reflection of laser light can propel small crafts up to 20% or more of the speed of light, then a method which uses the properties of resonance should be even more efficient, which in turn could allow for even higher relativistic speeds. One of Ring's philosophies was that we should strive to work with nature rather than attempting to overpower it. This falls in line with the principles of resonance and sound vibrations, and hence should apply to both luminous and gravitational vibrations as well. At the very least, Ring's testimony suggests that modern science is just now catching up with decades-old concepts. After all, with as many varied and detailed UFO sightings as there are, they can't all be classified as only made-up stories. Probability would suggest that a significant percentage of them will be legitimate accounts of actual observances and experiences. People are indeed seeing something in the skies and out in the deserts. The question is, what? Are all of these aerial anomalies the vehicles of ETs who seem satisfied with performing the same aerial acrobatics for nearly six decades? Or are they instead the results of decades of secret experiments and test flights falsely shrouded in the mystery and fake of otherworldliness? Perhaps time will tell. Thanks for staying with me. There will be more to follow along with some interesting experiments. Thanks for watching, and as always, stay tuned.